Yo, 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 what's going on, everybody? We are back with another episode. Excited to be with you guys. My name is Derry. My name is Eddie. And you listening to the Weird Perspective Podcast. Man, it's been a long time. It's been a long time, but we are back. Super excited to bring you guys this episode, man. E, what's been going on with you, bro? Yo, let's go. Man, we just um, it's been on the family vacations. Um, I, we went out to the ATL. We went to Georgia visiting family. Okay, okay. Um, where else? We uh, we went to Tennessee. Got to enjoy some time out there and, and really kind of just get refreshed, man, because it was it was much needed. So got some time with the family out there. I got some family in Georgia. I got my cousin. Shout out to my cousin Mikey. Um, yeah, he has a beautiful home, beautiful family. Um, nice. Spending time with them, man, and, and enjoying some weather out there and just a different scenery, man. The, the whole drive, right? I think that's the, the it's, it's, um, it's a little difficult, but we got through it, right? 15 yeah, y'all driving down that four kids, a newborn, man, just, traveling, bro. Yeah, 15 hours ain't no joke, man. But, and, uh, and these gas this, prices. Yeah, and he's, let's not even mention that. That was on. Man, that was all God there. But yeah, we got through it, man. The kids were actually really good. Um uh, and it was it was nice though, man. You know, those 15 hours, it, it gets a little um exhausting at times. But we got through it and it was nice to you know that that drive out there is really you have a lot of scenery, a lot of different uh, things to kind of look at and, and it just kind of gives you a relaxing uh time just to see that the greenery and all that, you know, everything on the way over there, the mountains and all nice. the things you got to go through. It was yeah, an yeah. So what'd you do first? You went to the ATL or you went to Tennessee? How'd you do it? Yeah, we drove straight, uh, like 15 hours straight to Georgia with all the stops and everything. Um, and then we spent four days there, came back and we spent another three days in Tennessee. So we drove like six hours back to Tennessee. And then from Tennessee, we spent like three or four days there and then drove back to Chicago. So did you run into any rappers when you was in Atlanta? Man, none. Dang. So no, yeah. I think uh, I think Lecrae is down. I think Lecrae lives in Atlanta yeah. right now. You, know, you got all the other rappers, the T.I.s and the Jeezy's. And yeah, yeah. You nah, ain't run into none of them dudes down there? It was more of a family thing. And just, you know, my, my, yeah, my family lives more towards the, the suburban uh, area of Georgia. So but it was a nice time, man. And I know it was much needed. What about you, man? I know you you got to go on your, your first flight, man, with your family. Yeah, huh? man. First official family vacation is in the books. And uh, it was a good one. Um, I thought it was going to be a lot more hectic at the airport. Um, but it was peaceful. It wasn't a lot of people up in the airport. We went super early. Um, our flight took off at like, uh, I think it was uh, 5, 5.30 a.m. Uh, the baby was good, besides the fact that I had to hold him the whole time. <laughs> Other than that, it was smooth, man. Easy in, easy out. Got to, uh, we went to Miami, Florida. Found this really nice little uh, low-key hotel right two blocks from the beach. Nice. So it was pretty. It was pretty nice, man. It wasn't a lot of things going on. It wasn't too many people out there. Um, I only can do about three days tops in Miami. I'm burned out after that. I just, it's too much. It's just a little too much for me down there. So I do my little time and then I get up out of there. Uh, but what was the weather, I, man? What was the weather? Oh, out? the weather was perfect. You know me, so you know anything yeah. over 80 degrees and it's real hot. I ain't coming outside. So, but it was like perfect weather bro um it was perfect enough to go to the beach uh, and walk around it was a nice little breeze at nighttime we did like this little stroll we walked down all those streets um but the weather was it was beautiful we uh we seen tank he actually was having dinner right across from us at the hotel that we was at they had a nice restaurant that was outdoors so we seen tank i didn't bother him or ask him for an autograph or a picture or anything like that uh my wife was the one that spotted him so and no matter how old he get though man 
This dude, he was just out there, bro. Straight muscle shirt and some little shorts. I was like, He's like in wow. perfect shape. Yeah, dude. I was just like, you know. Uh, but yeah, we seen Tank. She's seen some other people. My wife be spotting all the celebrities. I don't really be knowing who these people be. I don't really follow them like that. They could walk right past me and I'd be like, oh, I didn't even know. So uh, yeah, she did that. And then uh, went to the pool, went to the beach, had some pretty good food. Um, I got my Cuban sandwich is what I wanted when I was down there. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was chilling. It was my daughter's 13th birthday. Nice. So her golden birthday, 13 on the 13th. Yeah. And uh, man, so we was, uh, the Lord provided, we were able to go out there for uh, two days, had a good time. And then now we back in the shot, man, with all this drama out here with this weather. <laughs> we come back to reality, right? <laughs> yeah, man. Like, as soon as I got off the plane, I'm like, yeah, I'm still in like Miami mode. So uh, I got my hoodie on. I walk out the airport. I say, oh my goodness. It said it was supposed to be 60 that day. You know what it was when I got off the plane? 30. 42 degrees. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I was like, dude, my jacket or my, uh, my my son's hoodies, they were still in the bag. I'm like, bro, we're trying to find the Uber to get to the crib. Oh, it was man. drama, but it was like, welcome home sweet home, man. It's Chicago, man. It wouldn't be the windy city without no wind, bro. Act like you live here. <laughs> yeah. You should have had that sweater like in your pocket somewhere. You know, you gotta have all four seasons in your trunk of your car when you live out in Chicago. You gotta have rain boots, Tims, yeah. right? Jeans, shorts, basketball shoes, a hoodie, yeah. a our windbreaker. Our t shirts have turned into like a jacket. <laughs> Just pop into a hood somewhere. <laughs> yeah, man. Our, our uh, spring gotta fight back, though, bro. It's, it gotta fight back. I don't know what's yeah, going like, on. What? Yeah, what is going on, man? It's you know, like, it's, still waiting on like the grass is growing, but it's so, open as heck outside. I'm like, and then we had that 80 degree day last Saturday, and oh, then the next day geez. it was 45 again. And it's like, so that's Chicago, though, man. It's Chicago, though. Man, we've been dealing with it our whole lives. What can we do, right? Yeah. And so, uh, but yeah, man, so it's been a lot going on for these past three weeks, man. Uh, right off the top, man, oh, we see. Man. We see Elon Musk, man, doing billionaire things. This dude don't bought Twitter, bro. Yeah, finally. He I said finally. Ahead, I went ahead and, and bought my share, man. You bought some shares? I did, man. I had to buy a share. Oh, snap, man. I need I, to get. Hey, I, I got to throw my name in the hat somehow. Hey, bro. I'm going to be. Uh, we going to link up, man. I got to get back into these stocks, man. And uh, I got to buy me a couple, bro. Like I said, I know we had a conversation. I said, hey. If in a few years or years down the road, it just, the shares just skyrocket to the roof and, man, we're going to be on that next flight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I definitely going to get up in there, but I think I'm, I'm interested in uh, to see what he's going to do with the platform. I'm not on Twitter, so never had a Twitter, not interested, but uh, I might, we might have to get a weird perspective Twitter account going on, man. Yeah, we might we'll, be able to look into that. We'll see, we'll see how that works out, but, um, Man, really quick, bro. We got to get into these NBA playoffs, man. You know, we basketball heads over here. And uh, we love to hoop. We love to watch it. And uh, so right off the top, the Nets got spanked, man. So automatically, I already lost money. Dude, I two mean, like, who saw that coming, though, right? I did. Dude. I did. I thought it would be a battle, but I thought that they would come back. I thought it would go seven. But uh, these boys got swept, man. Yeah. KD and Kyrie are gone. No more. It's just it's gone. You know, um, actually, they actually had a really good team, though, man. They had some balance. They had some big guys. And you would think, man, they would have been able to squeeze out at least two games. Like, don't just go off like that. One, maybe two. Just uh, yeah, yeah. Nobody even went off. Like, nobody went off for, like, I think, I think Kyrie went off for 40. They still lost. But KD... 26, I think, was the highest he had in all, in all these games. Yeah. And it was just like nothing. Just straight pedestrian by his standards. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. Um, He's a top four player in the league. Like, there was something there. There was something there. I think he was injured or something. But whatever the case may be, they should have never got swept. And it was shocking to see. Well, I think he just got beat up. I think that they, they cut off, you know, they were playing the passing lane really good. 
Yeah. And I think they just took him out of his element and he didn't know how to bounce back. And maybe he tried to do too much, overthinking it, the lack of chemistry. Um, so I think a lot of that played the factor. Boston Skinny dude. Too. Boston got a lot of size, man. So like you said, playing the passing lanes and their size was really pushing up on them on their on their shots and just making it really tough for them. So yeah, a lot of you know, you gotta give credit to the Celtics, man. They did what they had to do. Um, and their coach. He's a really good coach. So they stuck to the game plan and they hey they earned it, right? That's what the playoffs is for, man. You gotta earn it. Yeah, yeah. It's oh. it's a, it's a, it's the next level. So uh, with that being said, talking about them, what we, what we, how, how we feeling about Ben Simmons, bro? How we feeling about this dude, man? Man, like sometimes I want to believe what he say, but man, it's rough, dude. <laughs> but, hey, they put a meme out, bro, with this dude on the sideline. Everybody has got all black on. This dude out there with green, yellow, whatever colors, man. looking like a straight up neon, like glow light that you see in the club. <laughs> Yeah, this dude, we saw every suit. Man, we saw every earring he had. He he out there icy, boy. He got the straight, his drip is crazy, boy. I'm like, man. I think he might've got more endorsements, more like jewelry endorsements and fashion endorsements while he was off. Cause it's like, hey, this dude's gonna be on the bench. He brings attention. Let's give him some endorsements. But then the last game, he didn't show up. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was kind of rough, man. Saying that he was gonna come out and that he was ready to play, and then, you know what? That I don't know if you saw the article. There was like an article that came out where he kind of confessed, you know, what was really wrong with him. I think, and you know, um, God forbid if it's, it's something like some type of mental, I don't know, disability or some type of mental, whatever the case may be. But he said it is kind of mental. And it's affecting uh, him physically, and it's um, I guess affecting his nerve system, and and that kind of triggers something. You know, they they said that this dude had back problems. First it was the mental, and then it was the back problems. They was going in on him on ESPN like, you ain't played since last June. How you hurt your back? What you hurt your back though? It yeah. was going in on him. But um, I think that you know some of that can play if you're not strong minded, um, and we know. We have our side conversations just about this generation, the entitlement, the lack of toughness that a lot of these these uh, these kids show. Um, it, it could be that you know he he uh-huh. you know he's in a he's in a grown man world, you know, it's grown man business, and it's being in that league. It's not for the weak hearted. You think about a person like Jimmy Butler, right? Went into Minnesota, was at the practice, like you know, y'all need me, like. I'm going to take the five weakest dudes and I'm going to beat the starters. And he got that rah-rah mentality. You know what I'm saying? He He's yeah. not going to back down. Blue and uh, yeah. you need that. You can be the most best player, but if you ain't got that dog in you, you're just going to get pushed to the side and people are just going to straight punk you in. That's going to affect you if you're not, if you don't have that toughness. And, stuff. and there's only one way we're going to figure that out. It's once he, once he comes back and he plays, we'll really find out what it really was. You know? Yeah, yeah. He yeah, he's a, he's a good player. I like him. I like him as a, as a basketball player. You know, they were calling him LeBron 2.0 at one point because he was easily averaging like 25 and 10, you know, 10 assists a game. So um, the skills are there. He just got to, you know, figure out what he want to do. You want your money, but you got to play too, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's going to go back and affect them in the uh, bargaining agreement. Stephen A was talking about that. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, – they come with a whole lot of new rules and hey, these players are going to have to fess up and play uh, they want to earn that check yeah earn millions man it's a privilege right yeah but well, moving on to somebody who is a dog for real Jason Tatum yeah that dude, man averaged 30 points a game man he was he was they were straight bullying um uh, the Nets bro he really stepped it up and showed the world like this who I am this is our time, and we had to take it, man. They were doing their thing, Jason Tatum. You've seen them. You've seen them kind of gradually, like, losing the playoffs in recent years. You've seen that he, every step of the way, like, he's grown, and now you see the more balanced and more polished player. And uh, he's got it all now. Like, he's playing defense. Now he can knock down the three. He's not only going, you know, to the cup or fading away or whatever it is. He's got a little bit mixed, um, and he's passing now. 
he's trusting his teammates. And I'm glad they didn't break up uh, him and him and uh, what's his name? Uh, the other guard. Uh, uh, what's his name? Brown. Oh, Brown. Jalen Brown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That didn't break him up, man, because that would have been a shame. I know they're, they're both like, they can be superstar. Well, he is a superstar, but Jalen Brown, breaking them up would have kind of probably backtracked them a little bit. Just uh, to see their growth. Kyrie Irving leaves, they these dudes take off. Man. You know what I'm saying? And uh like I mean, they mentioned a, uh keeping smart, right? Marcus Smart. Mm-hmm. And seeing how he's kind of improved his game too. Defensive player yeah. of the year. Yeah, defensive player, but he's also like scoring. He's his assists went up. So it just shows you, man, you put in the work. It's it's gonna show. So it's you know, hopefully the Bulls can catch on to that too. Man, that's well, you know. That's, Philly made it, man. Philly, Sixers, one of my favorite teams. Yeah. They made it, man. That's sad to hear um, MB got hurt. But then we get, I was just about to say, we get this sad news today that this dude's out indefinitely. We don't know how long that is, but if he doesn't play in the first two or three games, it's a wrap, bro. Yeah. I mean, he's the, he's the league, he's the leading scorer, right? Scoring champion, right? MVP candidate. And, um, Bro, now he's injured. All because they didn't take him out. They did what the Bulls did. Remember when the Bulls kept D Rose in? We're up 22 points. Kept and then the starters he in. Like, blows out his knee. Yeah, they like, were up like 29 points. Why yeah. you still got Embiid in the game? Yeah, that, that don't make no sense, man. No sense at all, bro. So, um, unfortunately, now we got to deal with the consequences of that. And so, we'll see. Yeah. But, uh... Getting to the Bulls, man. Is there hope for our Bulls? Man, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so, man. Because we need so much, man. You look at all these teams, right? Even you see, like, like Memphis. You see Memphis, and they got a bunch of, like, no-name dudes, but each and every one of them specialize in something. And you think about the Bulls, they got, like, three or four guys that are really skilled in certain areas. But then you look down the roster and it's like, man, we need so much. But um, man, I hope they continue to improve. It's definitely an improvement, right? We got some hope, um, especially if we sign, let's see if we sign Levine. I think that'll be the biggest thing too. And then what other like free agents we we um, attract, but and there's hope. There's hope and uh, I don't know how much hope we can hold on to. But. Man, we need a coach. We can have all them pieces, but we ain't got no coach. I don't like this coach. Yeah. Uh, he did an okay job, you know, with the pieces that he had, but I don't like this coach, man. Um, and so I just – we need to just get a big-name coach, man. We got Mark Jackson still out there. We got all these big-name coaches, bro. Just get a big coach that did something. We already see what Mark Jackson did with Golden State before they were Golden State, right? Um, he called Steph Curry and Clay the best shooting backcourt ever. He set the the foundation for that team. Yeah. And uh, now we need a coach like that, bro. Take these young guys. And the only way we get a big coach though is we we give up power. And the Bulls organization, they they they've always been, you know, real uh, stubborn and real uh, tight with uh, giving up any type of authority. And they like to keep those things separate, but. You know, all these top name coaches, they deserve a little bit more of, of an input, a little bit more authority. Um, like what who they're gonna draft, a little bit more authority over the roster, like who they're gonna trade and things like that. I don't see them getting any big name coach, so we can give up on that one, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, uh, we got this young boy, bro, probably one of my becoming one of my favorite guys to watch, man. Lil Ja Morant getting buckets, dunking on folks, man, putting people on posters, all types of stuff, man. He's trash talking, putting up call me signs, and, you know, he's really just snatching the soul, and we just seen him do that tonight. I got to go and watch the highlights. They literally won as we were starting this. But, um, man, how you feeling about Ja? Man, that dude is super talented. Man. He reminds me a lot of, uh, of uh, Derrick Rose with his uh, athleticism and his ability. And obviously he's gonna, he's only gonna get better, man. As soon as he polish up that jumper um, and, you know, kind of get a little bit more structured as far as the point guard goes, this dude's gonna be unstoppable. He's already yeah. unstoppable. Yeah, yeah. I, I look forward to uh, 
just watching him grow, man, into he's gonna be a big, big superstar in this league. And um, man, it's a lot of just talented dudes in the NBA, man. Um, I love. Man, it. I think I think the league is in good hands, man. Moving yeah. into the future, bro. It's getting super competitive, man. Yeah, like LeBron James and Melo and all them dudes, they're gonna be out of here. But the new generation, they're good. They're super skilled, super talented, and uh, I think uh, I think the league is in good hands, man. Moving forward. Yeah. Um, and so I want to talk about this last this last guy, man. It's my one of my all time favorite point guards, man. And I just want to let him know he probably's never gonna hear this podcast, but I'm praying for CP3, man. Stay healthy. Praying for this dude to stay healthy, bro. Just stay healthy, my guy. Oh uh, man, uh, it's, every time he plays, I get scared, bro. Sometimes I don't even want to watch the games. So I'm like, I just don't want him to get injured, man. I want him to get a ring so bad. He's one of the guys that I'm like, I want to see him get a ring. I'm not a Suns fan. I just want to see him get a ring and just go out riding off to the sunset. Just get a ring. All the things that he's able to accomplish. He just had a game. This dude was 14 of 14. Yeah. He had a perfect game from the field. It's crazy. And I was um, kind of losing hope last year. I said, man, that was the last year. That was it, dude. That's the last hurrah for him. But I'm glad he's still there. You know, they're pushing the playoffs. They got, you know, obviously probably a top three uh, best team. Um, they can definitely, definitely win the championship if if all goes well. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a low-key uh, Warriors fan. I yeah, I, w- I was gonna talk about the Warriors, but I think they get enough shine, and yeah. that's my pick now because the two teams that I picked to go to the finals, one didn't even make the playoff, and the other one just got swept. So yeah. I'm like, you know, Warriors. I had them up there, so I'm like, I don't need to talk about the Warriors. They're gonna do. They stay healthy. They're gonna do what they do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They I gonna, wanted to uh, see the the conference game because it'd be just sad to watch CP3 lose again. Oh yeah, I ain't even think about that, dude. I'll just give you the updates, man. I'll, I'll text you while the game is. <laughs> Dang, man, I gotta think about that, bro. You see, Curry one of them from three, and oh, that's gonna be bad, bro. But we'll see. It's what it is, man. Um, so who you got, man? We are we going into the second round? I think all the teams are good now. They're all they're all done for the most part. We got um. Miami's gonna play Philly. Who you got for that? Uh, definitely, Miami's too balanced, man. Did you see the last game where um, Jimmy Butler didn't even play? They played Oladipo. This dude is still playing at All Star level. It's like they're too deep, man. And yeah. the only way I don't see them coming out is if like Butler gets hurt or like I don't know. I don't know. Like they close their stadium down, maybe. And... <laughs> Yeah, no, they 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 they're they're a solid team, bro, and they got great veterans and leadership. Eric Sprocher is probably coach to me, probably coach of the year. Well, I would say second place because he's been doing it for so long. But I'm yeah. uh, he he's an amazing coach. He's been consistent. They're always a competitive team every year. So I got uh I got the Heat, man. Especially now with the beat out, I got the Heat in uh in five. I can see that. Got the heat at five, unfortunately, Miles. I haven't seen, you know, the other issue is that James Harden. I mean, oh, yeah. Oh, we don't talk like, about James no more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, he, you know, he's good, but he's not, you know, Houston Rocket, James Harden. You know? Yeah. Something's just not there. Even in beat said it, like, man, we need him to play, like, his old. Yeah, he needs to get his shots up. It's, yeah, man, so... Yeah, he gonna have to step up now. We need to see old Houston James Harden now because MB's not uh-huh. playing. So, bro, I need you to drop 40 every night. That, that might play a big factor, man. Just uh, the way he came into the season, like, not not conditioned, it's probably catching up to him now. He's probably getting into his conditioning, but when you got to push your body, that's something you got to Well, like. no, he, remember, he, uh, they were talking about, he didn't come into shape, but when he got traded, Remember, he shredded all he got. They were like, man, what kind of diet is James Harden on, bro? Like, they were talking about this dude on ESPN. Like, we need to know his diet, bro, for real. Yeah. Uh, Because he just shredded all that weight. Like, what? You was just holding on to that weight? Did you have a fat suit on? Like, what was going on? Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, man, Philly's gonna lose. Unfortunately, I like Doc Rivers, but they're out of there. Um, the Bucks and uh, Boston. Who you got? Milwaukee and Boston. No, that's a tough one. But the Bucks are kind of beat up. I think Boston. Boston in six, maybe. Yeah, they got that young fire right now, bro. And as dominant as Giannis can be, um, I just think that they're gonna come out. They're gonna take him out of the game. And they're gonna force Militant uh and um uh, what's the other dude that they got uh who's their point guard? Um oh, Holiday. Holiday. They're gonna be like, you one of y'all gotta beat us. But yeah. Giannis, they gonna they gonna they gonna uh he's so dominant, I don't think you can stop him. He's such a force of just you so can't. strong and big. Nobody can guard him. Nobody. I don't think nobody can guard him, but they're definitely gonna double him and triple him and they're gonna take him out of the game and they're yeah. gonna force the other two guys. We One got, of y'all got to beat us. No, it wouldn't shock me, though. It wouldn't shock me if Milwaukee ends up beating them. Just because they've done it before. We thought this when they won the championship. And there's no way Milwaukee's going to do it. And then they just start rolling through all these teams. Yeah. I don't root for Milwaukee at all, ever, just because I'm a Chicago guy. And I don't root for any other team that's in my division. So just for the listeners and the people watching this podcast, yeah. You will never ever see me root for any other team in our dish in our in our division. So Milwaukee, I like Giannis, but I'm never gonna root for you guys. Y'all are always gonna be just the cheeseheads to me. And the Green Bay Packers, we ain't even gonna talk about y'all. So we're gonna move on from that. <laughs> uh Phoenix versus Dallas. That's a tough one. That's a real tough one. Luca. But uh Phoenix. Phoenix should be able to squeeze it out. Um, they, man, them too. They might give them some problems. I can see that going six. Um, well, Lucas, Lucas banged up too, though. Um, yeah. Excuse me. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a prediction for for that one, bro. Uh, they might go seven. Yeah, I can, like I was just gonna say that. I was, that was what I. Was it gonna might say. go seven, bro. I you know, Luca, Luca ain't backing down from nobody. There's just no chance. And then they got uh, Jalen Brunson, too. He's a really solid point guard. So, yeah. So, I yeah, I, th- I think that's going seven. And then uh, just because I, I want to see CP3 make it to the finals again, I'm just going to rock with the Suns. Yeah. Even though I like Dallas better as an organization, as a team, I like Mark Cuban as an owner. Um, I'm going to rock with, uh, I'm going to pick the Phoenix Suns to win at seven. Yeah. And then uh, lastly, our boys, man, Golden State versus uh, Memphis. Who you got in how many games? No chance, bro. I'd say uh, either five games or a clean sweep. I'm giving them a gentleman's sweep, bro. I'm Golden State in five. Yeah, five. Golden State. I got to I got. I I gotta get y'all one game. Yeah. I give them one game, but that that's it. It's gonna. Be... You know, it wouldn't shock me if they win more. Because their defense is really good, but they won't be able to keep up as far as scoring. Well, once once the they can't go to, they're not gonna lose that lead, Golden State. Yeah. So all this back and forth that um the um Phoenix has been able to do going against Minnesota, they ain't gonna be able to do that with Golden State. Right. Golden State, they they you know they got the Splash Brothers, you know um they're not gonna have that comeback ability. Minnesota just pretty much gave up them games. They don't have the the mental capacity to be able to maintain those leads. Um, Ja's not gonna lay down, but he's not gonna have enough to uh, to keep that to keep to keep that going. He can't do it all by himself. And they're a young team, inexperienced, and the Warriors know how to win. So they've been there multiple times. They're gonna they're gonna knock it out. So I got Warriors in five. Yeah, I see got that. Him. Got them in five, baby. And so. Oh, man, we went through some sports, recapped our vacations, but now we're going to get into why we are here. And we, today we're going to be talking about biblical fatherhood, biblical yeah, yeah. fatherhood, man. And so let's dive into this topic, man. You know, me and Eddie, we're both, we're fathers. We take pride in our fathers. And um, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to the world, right? There is a direct attack on fathers. 
there is a direct attack. It's happening right in front of our eyes. Um, and so we live in Chicago and the youth, the crime that's happening with the youth, it's on the rise continuously. It's always been there, but it's just going up and up and up. Carjackings, the average age of these carjackers is between 11 and 16. That's crazy. 11 and 16 years old. They're out here stealing cars. They're stealing catalytic converters. Um, it's crazy. It's crazy. And it all comes from a lack of fathers, a lack of men stepping up into our roles, the, the, the divine roles that God has given us. It's, it's, not, it's not there. And so when the fathers are there, or away rather, there's a curse on the land kids are running rampant there's no order there's no structure that all falls on us fathers when those things happen and so today we want to talk about the importance of fatherhood right and we want to talk about it from a biblical perspective yeah and i'm super excited for this topic man um you might ask why i said i truly Count it a blessing. And I count every blessing I have as far as when it comes down to being in the position where I'm at, um, being intentional with uh, every moment to moment, day to day, raising and living life, uh, teaching my kids. And I know it's true. I know it's true for you too, man. Uh, we count every blessing as far as being fathers and being in this position that we're at. We can be intentional. And, uh, and I know it's true for both of us, man, because we we kind of sharpen one another. We've grown together, uh, you know, seven, 17 plus years of friendship. We've kind of grown into this. And now I got four kids. Um, you got more kids than me. Um, and I love this. I love this. Dude. So I'm super excited about this. So um, thank you guys for joining us. Let's dive right in, brother. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm, I'm excited, man. I've grown to love being a father. In the beginning, it was a lot of fear. I was scared, you know, it was like, oh, I got a kid in my in my mind. I always had this, like, I have my first kid. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. You know, you kind of play out the type of father that you that you want to be. But then uh, when reality hits, I thought about it, and it was, I had no real good examples of what a father was. Right. Like, I didn't see it on the day-to-day. Um, and so, we don't want to dive into this, man. And we're going to talk about this from uh, a lot of scholars, a lot of people that write books, and they, they do these topics on fatherhood. A lot of them, they start at this basic principle, right? These pillars of what we're called to do. Our, our, our main role as fathers is to provide, to protect, and to empower our families, our children. All the commands when it comes to raising kids, it all goes to the father. As I was reading Tony Evans' book, uh, Kingdom Man Rising, or you know, Kingdom Man, the first one, it rocked me. I was like, wait, what? He talks about it. I was like, all the commands when it comes to training up your kids, the instructions, they all go to the father. They all go to the man. It's not to the women. He doesn't address the women. It's how I was, it was uh, blew my mind and it gave me, uh, uh, it just changed my perspective on being a father. You know, so many times in America, we lead, we, we like, well, I'm the man, I'm gonna provide, I'm gonna go to work. And then the women, we're gonna leave y'all to raise the kids. Mm-hmm. But that's not how God intended for it to be. And so today we're gonna talk about how these pillars, how they get played out and what they look like in our day to day. And so um, this first pillar, right, is uh, provide, provide, provide. E, what does uh, providing mean to you? And what does that look like in your life, bro? Yeah, um, providing for me is, um, I think, obviously we can, we can dive into the financial aspect of it, right? Um, providing financially, right? So that we can have food on the table, a roof over our head, um, aside from obviously clothing and things like that. 
Um, more importantly for me, um, and like I mentioned, um, just being intentional from moment to moment and, and in our children's lives, uh, for me is providing um, the emotional and the spiritual uh, support for our kids. Um, because it's something we didn't we didn't grow up with. Um, and, you know, there's a call. There's a call now for us to kind of change the tide of the things that we didn't have and also learn from Jesus' example, right? He said that apart from the Father, he did nothing. And I want to instill that example, not only for our kids, but for me, right? As, as my Christian walk goes, it should flow over and reflect into my kids' life. And that's kind of how I see um, the providing aspect of our fatherhood, how it should be played out. Um, and the, you know, obviously the principles behind that. Um, you'd say emotionally, right? To kind of dive in. We can, we can talk about the financial all day, right? Everybody might point to that. Um, but it's not mere existing for me. You know, I know a lot of people might have that take on, on uh, fatherhood. Like, it's just enough to exist. It's just enough to be home, right? Like, it's just good enough, man. Like, being home and allowing uh, the kids to see that you're a provider, you come home every day, you're working. Um, is that enough, though? You know, is that is that's the question I would pose. I would pose to our, our audience, but also to myself. Is that enough? For me, it's not enough. Because I, I've seen what that looks like in my life. I've seen how that played out. Um, to actually know my father, right? Didn't have my dad intentionally in my life. But to know my father um, and knew that he existed, saw him throughout my childhood, but didn't have him intentionally in my life, played a big role. And the man that I was becoming um, in my early adult life, and what kind of grew in me, because there wasn't any intentionality of uh, communicating. As we see, um, if I can come come with a, a biblical perspective on it, we see that God provided for Adam in the garden everything that he needed beforehand. But not only did he just provide and say, here, just go on and do your thing, right? He didn't just throw it all out there. He gave him instruction. But then he walked with him. He walked with him and there was like an intimacy. There was a connection in where he, every step of the way, God was walking with Adam. And that's something that is critical as far as providing um, in our fatherhood, right? God says fathers, it's walking alongside and living a transparent life um, with our kids and living that out um, as Christians, right? Um, but for me, yeah, that's the bigger thing. That, that's that's my takeaway on on this and the providing aspect of our father and that that it's it goes far beyond providing. So providing for, for, for providing a, a presence, right? Like, right, and being intentional, right? Right. Not only a presence, but uh, an intentional presence, right? Because we can all do a nine to five, come back home, eat dinner. Mm-hmm and go about our night and barely speak two words to our kids. And, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Go through the motions, but do we do we die to ourselves and spend those intimate uh, moments with our kids, our kids individually? You know, do we sit at the table with our wife and kids and talk to them about how they're doing, maybe their struggles, living that transparency out with them, being vulnerable with them? Oh, man, I actually had a bad day myself. Providing that is what goes way further than providing finances and an atmosphere. It goes yeah. further because we've seen we see fathers and families that have strived in worse elements. Man, we've seen people live in a one-bedroom apartment but live a happier life than you know us living a luxurious life of a house. And, Everybody got their own room and which is well off. But where do we truth, truly find that efficiency as far as providing for 
um, our family and our kids. And um, when it goes deeper into the emotional and the spiritual aspect of life, right? Um, so that's 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 kind of my approach um, and my takeaway on the providing aspect of, of our fatherhood. I know you. I know you probably can add to, to your. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I wanna. I wanna definitely. Uh, dive in there and uh, share my perspective and I think they all go hand in hand I think that they I think a lot of times you can't have the one without the other because you're going if you if you take away the finances you're emotionally drained right and then you can't emotionally be there you're trying to dig yourself out of this hole definitely some balance and, and yeah. being able to, you know, support your family. And so I do want to touch on on the financial aspect of it because I've been in these situations a lot of times in my life, man. It wasn't until really about going on like four years ago that I really started to grab a hold of the finances in my life where I can be able to provide for my family comfortably. And um, for a long time, it was a strain on on my family it was a strain on my marriage it was definitely a strain on my kids um and god doesn't necessarily call us to be like hey go get rich right which in america that's what they tell us to go get the money right work 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 as much as you can because you're gonna have money 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 but at the end of the day your kids are suffering you work so much you can't even spend the money it's just sitting in the bank and nobody's happy Right. And so how do we find balance um, in, in calling? Because God says to provide. He even says in, in Proverbs, right? He says that uh, a good man, right? A righteous man leaves an inheritance for his grandchildren. Mm-hmm. How can you leave an inheritance for your grandchildren if you ain't making no money? And so um, there's many things that can go into an inheritance, but you break it down he's talking about his his finances there's more things with that but it definitely starts with finances you got to be able to provide the basic needs for your kids right so shelter food clothing right being able to take care of your kids and all the other stuff um it's kind of like extra but first and foremost we need to be able to provide and so when you see god in the garden with adam he's providing him all his needs but he also shows him how to get it Yep. He shows him how to to plant. He shows him how to, he tells him, hey, you got dominion over all this. Now you got to go and you got to work the land. As fathers, we need to be there to show our kids how to make money, how to work the land. And we don't, we, you know, I don't know how to do everything, but what I do know, I need to be able to give that to my kids. And in the same time, with me being able to give them those skills that I have and hand those skills down to them, I'm spending intimate time with them. I'm being emotionally there. And so that's why I said it all, it all goes hand in hand. And then you add the spiritual aspect to that as well, because I'm bringing them up in church. I'm reading the Bible with them. I'm letting them know, hey, the reason why I do this the way that I do, the reason why I go to work is because God made it to where men have to work. A man that doesn't work doesn't need. So this is why I go to work. I'm not just going to work just because I want to be away from you guys. I go to work because I'm called to provide. I'm called to to have a shelter. And so I have to go to work. We have five kids. So I got to be able to p- provide for all you guys. You know what I'm saying? And so I think the um, financially, especially here in America, minority neighborhoods, it's not preached a lot. It's not taught to us about how to, number one, get our finances and then to keep them. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is this is what my training was for credit. Take care of your credit. <laughs> Nobody took me to the side and said, hey, this is a credit card, right? This is your credit score. This is how your credit score works. This is how you use credit. This is how you can mess it up, right? Nobody told me that. Yeah. My training for credit was take care of your credit. Yeah. And I, uh, it is like, okay, you know, uh, my dad, my dad's way of parenting, be good. Okay, well, what is being good? What is that? Yeah, what does that mean to be good? You know what I'm saying? 
And so it was all these like really just blank statements that didn't have anything with them. And um, I t- in the beginning, I took a lot of that into my way of parenting with my kids. You know, be good and do all these things. But I didn't explain to them what being good was. You know what I'm saying? And so you fast forward into to being in church and now oh, we're a family that structures our life according to the Bible and we do devos and we read and we pray together. It's um, it's definitely bringing a lot of things to the surface. Yeah. And so, yeah, I would say that they all, all three go together spiritually, right? You got to be spiritually in line to be able to do any of these things first and foremost. And then the Bible talks about money. The Bible talks about money a lot. So obviously God had a plan that he wanted us to have with our money. And he, he calls us to be good stewards over our resources. And so I think they all go together. I think they all go together. And um, when we do them in that way, you know, um, I think that that's how we can provide and have balance right not being I'm a, I'm a truck driver right so i can easily go make 150k right now right. i can call my job i can tell them hey will put me on the over the road board or put me on the otr board and they'll say okay and then monday when i go in that i'll have a sleeper truck waiting for me and i'll go over the road but when i go over the road i'm over the road nobody's home i can't i can't you know if we if we just sticking with these three pillars i can't provide i can't protect and i can't empower because i'm not here right i can't do anything some of it right with technology now but is there an intentional personal approach to that right it's different there's a difference you're not going home every night you're not you're not reading you're not praying like they can't feel you they can't touch you there's a chemical like that releases in us when we're able to embrace one another right not just our kids but our wives but even you know us as friends like when I see you, you know, that's why like fellowship and in-person fellowship is so important. And I think, you know, technology is an amazing thing, but it's also can be misused. And we miss a lot of the blessings and a lot of the gifts that God has for us when we have uh, to come together in person. And so that's just, you know, my perspective on um, on providing, you know, and um, I think that when we when we find a balance with this, you know, financially, providing and then emotionally providing like you know my kids being able to see their dad cry right me being able to talk to them about why I'm crying you know I grew up like you don't cry you hold that in you right. almost gotta like suck up your tear back boy you be around certain people <laughs> you can't you can't let that you can't let that tear drop or they go they gonna go at you you know what I'm saying and so um me allowing my son to cry I remember the first time when my wife had to correct me he was crying and I was like, and stop all that crying, man. And then she, you know, my wife had to correct me. Like, what's wrong with him showing his emotions? Yeah. You know, and, and, it, and, it, and it rocked me. And I was like, man, man, you're right. Like, how yeah. come he, he no, number one, he's a little kid. He was super small. He don't understand any of these emotions and how they use it. Why am I trying to force him to be this hard dude? You know what I'm saying? Like, he's just a super small kid. Yeah. Um, and so that 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 definitely rocked me and gave me like some new insight. Like, yeah, why do we tell our men not to show emotion, not to show feelings? You know what I'm saying? Um, and so, um, yeah. And then um, just spiritually is um, providing for them, taking them to church, right, and bringing them up in the word. You know, the Bible says that we should train our kids up in a way that they should go when they're older. They won't depart from it, right. you know. Um, and I think that we've definitely, in our culture and our society, we got away from the spiritual aspect of raising our kids. Yeah. Uh, praying for our kids and and bringing them up, you know. And my my mom was single. Um, she raised me and my sister, and uh, man, she made us go to church. And we were I'm talking about old school church, bro. I'm talking about like. You got Tuesday, you know, Bible, you got Tuesday uh, choir practice, Wednesday Bible study, right? Friday night revival, which lasts, could last to one in the morning. Then you got Sunday, you got two services on Sunday. Two of them things. <laughs> oh, 
you be at church you have Sunday school right so you got to get there like nine in the morning then you got certain regular service that started like 10 30 11 o'clock yeah that runs over don't let the spirit get the moving and people being slain and the spirit falling all over the place then you eat you know what I'm saying the church usually always used to cook then you got second service second service going to seven o'clock at night bro we used to be at church all the time yeah. um and, but you know my mom she that was the foundation that she you know, making us learn scriptures and memorize them. you know what I'm saying like you get no punishment if you don't you know take this stuff seriously and learn, learn God's word and so my mom did the best she could man with what she had and it definitely played a major role in my life even when I got older and I started to rebel those memories that I had of my mom I could never like become an atheist I couldn't I could never with a clear conscience say you know what God doesn't exist because I seen God in my mom so many nights my mom is in her room and it's just her and the Lord she doesn't know that I'm woke and she's speaking in tongues right she's flowing it my mom flows in the prophetic she's uh very very sometimes it's spooky and I share with you some stories of my mom and her knowing about things. And I'm like, how does she know that? Nobody knows this. Yeah. You didn't know it. Nobody, my Tawatha didn't know it. Nobody knew it. And it's like, how the heck did she know this? She always had a divine connection with God in us. And uh, man, just her prayer life. And I think, man, that, that same discipline that we have to have when it comes to our kids and raising them up, yeah. telling them the importance of reading the Bible, explaining it to them um you know your kids if they're old enough to read they should have their own personal bible they should be reading that thing you know what i'm saying it's something that i have to get better at being more consistent with it as far as um i, yeah, I used to have uh my oldest i would give her a chapter a day to read and we would do the basics who what when where how you know what i'm saying why and then i would have her write down whatever question she had and then we would talk about it and it's just to get their minds flowing about God. And 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 I think like as fathers, man, we gotta lead that out. We gotta lead by example. And so spiritually, you know, that's what it is. Um I share this verse, Ephesians six, verse four. Fathers, do not stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instructions of the Lord powerful verse for fathers some verses some translations say don't exasperate your kids like don't be that dad that causes your kids to be angry to the point where they start to resent you they don't respect you and ultimately they walk away um, not taking in any value in what you say and I, I see it with someone very close to me and you know who that person is I'm not going to share names um, but that that person grew up. His dad is a non-believer, and this person went through a whole lot of trauma, and he never got the proper help. He didn't have any spiritual bringing uh, upbringing, and now we've seen that affects in his life to the point now where he's he's gonna be a dad, and he got so many things that he has to do and uh, unlearn. You know, and and learn new things, and he's a baby that's about to have a baby, and the cycle is going to continue. And until us fathers step up in this area of emotionally and spiritually being available for our kids, the cycle is going to these cycles are going to continue to happen. If I can interject just a little bit, I think um, a lot of it too. If we're not if we're not aware, right, in our own spiritual walk. We see that society and even the dynamic within the home with technology and things like that is desensitizing um, uh, society and kids within themselves and to the point where, right, you could almost leave it up to them and um, where children and society like, uh, you think the schools, right, they're desensitizing the, the emotional and spiritual connection between um, us parents and our kids and giving them the right um, and giving them almost uh, the say-so. Oh yeah, um, we're gonna get into that. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, we could. I won't dive in um, directly into that, but um, I wanted just to kind of touch on that because is it enough just to exist, right? Because society does a good job of convincing us that um, this whole, if I can say, quote unquote, biological father, right, is good enough. You know that that's your father, he exists. But if that were true, right, even for like our marriages, is it just enough to coexist um, because we're legally married? It's not enough. We have to be intentional in every aspect. Um, and I shared with you um, this, uh, uh, with, uh, I shared this with you earlier about our, um, my wife and I are being uh, devotional, um, being intentional, right? And it says that it's just a reflection of our connection with, with God. If we have a true connection and faith with a, with a real God, then it's gonna reflect in our relationship with our spouse. Yeah. And I might have to add, us as parents, it works the same way. Why? Because Paul, um, he he uh, addresses uh, God the Father as Abba Father, and um, it says that in the uh, Aramaic uh, meaning, it says that it's used to emphasize an intimate, closer, genuine relationship the father mm. and that's the approach that we should have and it's not just good enough as society would say biologically but more importantly emotionally and spiritually being intentional with our children on a day-to-day -day basis mm. there's not a day there's not a day uh, and you know my motto is always to to live as as today was my last day I know that a lot of people might not have that approach. Sometimes it's kind of weird. I have to be honest. Like, I, I, I'm going to bed with my wife, and I'm like, yo, if I don't make it to tomorrow, though. <laughs> if I don't wake up, girl, just know I love you, you know, and, and hold it down. Everything I did, right? Everything I, I, I did with the kids, every example we set, man, push this thing forward, you know? And I think that, um, man, if we all took a certain approach, right? And, and we're not all gonna be, I'm not talking perfection, right? We're not all gonna be perfect, but um, when we talk about spiritual disciplines, right? Teaching our kids how to pray and then holding holding to Proverbs 22, 6, right? Now you mentioned this earlier, training up the kid in the way of the Lord, uh, the way he should go. And even when he grows old, he'll never depart. I know that that example in my life, like you mentioned your mom praying, that example was set for my grandma, and that's something that has never left me. Actually, it left it left like the biggest um, imprint of my life um, because I saw that through her spiritual disciplines and her true, genuine love and uh, relationship with Christ, man, that that overflowed and reflected over to me, and literally it was like a gap of. Um, every fatherless um, uh, void that I had was kind of filled with her, with whatever, however God was using her in my life uh, growing up. So you, intentionality and being there emotionally and spiritually, man, we can, we, I can attest to that because she played that role for me. I didn't have my dad there, but then God finds ways, man. When he has his hand on our lives, he knows and he finds ways to love his children. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the bigger thing, right? We have a father in, in heaven. There's not only a God, but he's God the Father. And how much more should we, in reverence, right, in love and and um, in admiration, should we reflect that through our own father, right? We take the direct reflection from God the Father. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, definitely awesome to um, you know kind of go over the dialogue and go over how God I mean a uh, uh, father providing the meaning yeah. of the spiritual emotional aspects there's so many layers man that you can dive into it is, it is a lot. Uh, even just like I'm thinking about a whole bunch of things like thinking about financially and 
I keep bringing up financially is because I struggled with it for such a long time, yeah. right? And then um, just to have the perspective of like, I'm not chasing riches. And some people don't understand that when I say it. Yeah. I got a personal like salary goal that I want to eventually hit. Right. But if I never hit that goal, I'm fine. You know what I'm saying? As long as I could be able to provide a roof and clothes and and, and shelter, warm beds for my kids, I don't, I don't, I don't care about anything. Everything else is a plus for me. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, but yeah, man, we can we just go on and on about that. But um, let's dive into protect, right? So we talked about providing, right? Financially, emotionally, spiritually. Let's talk about protecting, right? And, and, and what does protection mean? Why do we have to protect? Um, why is this only, why are we only called to protect and not the women? But <laughs> uh but what are we what are we protecting our kids from, right? We're talking about kids on here, right? Yeah. Um, and one of those things is from dangerous people, dangerous adults. Now, fathers, saved, unsaved, right? Believers, non-believers, wherever you fall, don't be running off on your kids. Somebody's out here acting crazy. Even if you can't fight, even if you ain't got a gun or a knife, it's your job to do what you got to do to make sure that you keep that kid it's safe. Yeah. So don't be... <laughs> it should be like a switch that goes off when you want to protect the people that you love. Like a Will Smith switch or which one? <laughs> <laughs> why? Why? Let's do that to bring up the Will. He had, My yeah, bad. yeah. Throw that is it too early? Is it, is it too? Is it too soon for the Will Smith jokes? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> um, we need to be. Able, we have to be willing and to protect our kids from from dangerous people, dangerous adults, right? Uh, we also need to be able to protect them from dangerous friends warning them about certain groups and cliques and people that they're seeing at their school you know people that they're like man why is that person acting like this or you know and and, and this group does this and that stuff looks cool and we got to be able to break that stuff down to guard them from that right and then um guarding them from ideas of the world this is a big one because it, it comes all of a sudden, kids being in school, like you were talking about early, Eddie, yeah. with they want to throw this and they want to do this and they want to teach kids about sex younger. And it's like, yo, my, let me tell my kids about sex. As far as how the body works and stuff, I don't have an issue with that, right? I, I definitely want to look over the material to make sure y'all know some weird stuff. But you would talk about the body, not a ashamed we all have bodies they all have parts and those parts you know what i'm saying yeah. so that's science i don't have an issue with that but when you want to start telling kids about sex and explaining to them gender that kids don't even think about that stuff at those ages that they're trying to implement right uh and then you know just certain movies that promote certain behaviors and certain ideas and certain thoughts that they that they make to look cool um, and I'll say this as a side note the world has Satan has tricked us into removing him from the world and his influence on it to the point where we say certain things about not watching something because of a, of a spiritual aspect of it a spiritual dynamic of it it's like man nah, that just grieves me you know i don't want to watch that or i can't listen to that music man it just grieves me and now it's just like ah man you being some over spiritual stuff and that's become like the norm now to the point where people don't even they don't even like recognize satan for who he is and what he does anymore it's just like a trick like i said i'm gonna make them forget me and but that's another podcast for another day. Yeah, but that's, um, that's some discipleship right there. Yeah, yeah. And so we got to be willing to protect our kids from these things. Um, and then I'll share with you guys 
why it's so important is um, protecting our kids from, you know, people, you know, uh, harmful adults, certain friend groups, and uh, even the ideas of the world. And how do we protect them, right? We're using scriptures. And so Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God. And it's profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This verse, yes, applies to our kids as well. We need to be equipping them, right? We need to be training them up in righteousness. We need to be showing them the way that the enemy moves, the agendas that he's trying to plant right the, the the things that he's doing in the world we need to be guarding them protecting them from that and we do that by influencing them and training them up in scripture yeah speaking to them about the bible speaking to them about god and the and, and the, the the last thing that i'll say is we can't be scared to talk to our kids about sin there are a lot of christians that they don't talk to their kids about sin they just tell them to stay away from that because it's bad or that's a sin. Don't do it. Right. But then when your kid becomes 21 and they had that first sip of that drink and they like, oh, mom, me and daddy was tripping. I just hit. And now they're drunk and they're dancing on the table because you never warned them of the fact that, hey, if you drink too much, you'll get drunk and you'll start acting crazy. Right. And now they're they're like. They were just trying to keep me from having fun. You never talk to your kids about sex because you're like, oh, it's sex. No, no, I'm not going to talk to them about sex. Yeah. But not knowing that, yo, at 10 and 9, 10, 11 years old, kids are having sex. Unfortunately, and this is not a brag, my first sexual encounter was at 11 years old. Lord, have mercy on the things that I was exposed to that I had my first sexual encounter at 11. And as a father of five kids, I can't even fathom any of my kids having any type of sexual encounters at 11 years old. I got a 13 year old right now. Will Smith for real. You know what I'm saying? But we bad boys too in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Reggie? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but I, I think we, we, we live in a world now where everything is uncovered nothing is hidden nothing's in the closet it's not like hey yo that sin's over there the only way you're gonna find out about it is if you go over there no it's like all the sins are here they're uncovered and now you get to see it everything right you know but kids ask me hey man why is a man kissing another man i thought it was a man and a woman i have to explain to them now the sin of homosexuality and i have to be very honest Right, I have to talk to them on their levels, whatever their levels that they're at. But if it's my 13 year old, she's very smart. She understands. She's a very logical. She understands a lot of things. So hey, I got to pull her to the side and say, hey, listen. There's certain people that like that, right? And so you got to be real with your kids about sin. I got to tell my boys when they when they start looking at girls and I catch him looking at that first girl that walks by hey oh that was a pretty girl okay that's cool it's okay to look but I have to have a real conversation with them about lust and how it can you know get set up in their heart and, and what kind of desires can come from that we got to be real with our kids about sin and so I know for me it wasn't a lot of uh it wasn't a lot of talks of sin what they can lead to the destructions of them and the fact that they feel good Sins feels good, otherwise we wouldn't do them. So we gotta let our kids know, like, oh, sin, oh, this sin is gonna feel good to you. Whatever your sin is, whatever you like, it's gonna feel good. You're gonna enjoy it. You're gonna want to do it more. That's how the devil's gonna entice you with it. You know what I'm saying? And so, uh, yeah, we gotta we gotta protect our kids, man, from physical harm, spiritual harm, right? Influences of the world. We we gotta be dads that that do that right they need to see us um we gotta guard them when they come home from school i'm pretty sure you're gonna touch on this eddie 
uh, I love your points because you bring the, the practical side. So I, I don't want to touch too much, but just having dinner with our families and talking to our kids about, man, what happened at school? Yeah. What'd you talk? Oh, what y'all talk about? You know what I'm saying? What's your friends' names? Getting to know your your kids' friends. We live in a generation, bro. I grew up, we knew everybody on the block. We knew their mamas, we knew their daddies, we knew who was cheating on who, we knew who was, we knew everything. It was literally a community. We knew everybody. Everybody knew all everybody business. And today, I have people that live on my street, I don't know their names. I have people that live in the same building as me right now, I don't know their names. Yeah. See these people every day. And so we gotta, we gotta, we just, we, we're called to protect and I think we need to do better and take more pride in protecting our kids. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, to your to your points, um, I do want to bring a practical um, point to this. Uh, and I'll give you an example. I was over a family member's house. And I think this is kind of the, this is kind of the mindset that we grew up with, um, which is there wasn't asked, you know, there wasn't necessarily a spiritual or a biblical um, perspective on it. But I was over a family member's house, and I go, and it's uh, my, that family member, and he starts using vulgar and like uh, curse words, right, profanity around my kids, right? Obviously, obviously, a standard, something we don't do around within our own home, right? When we teach our kids, you know, about profanity and how not to use those words. So I go and I'm hearing, we're getting our food, we're about to have dinner with them and things. But I hear him, he's running out the mouth and he starts saying these words. And right away I walk from the kitchen down to the dining room in his house. And I ask him respectfully, like, man, can you cut the language? Like, can you, you know, be careful with the language you got the kids and everything? Yeah. And instead of being respect, like the way I came in respect, instead of getting a respectful answer, just out of respect for my kids, the answer I got was, they're gonna hear it anyway. Why you? Why would you stop it? And, oh my God, that is... Like, oh, man. what? And that's, that's literally the mindset I grew up with, you know? Not to throw any of my parents on the bus, right? But that's literally the mindset we grew up with. And I think that was like a more traditional, um, unspiritual mindset that society kind of pushes on and says, man, I'd rather them hear it here or experience it here within our home, um, opposed to them doing it out there in the world and then they get caught up with the wrong people. Let me guard them here and experience it here. Like allow it in my house. It's it kind of is so counterproductive. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's handicapping. It's it's handicapping. It's a big hindrance. Um, when you when you do that, you know what I'm saying. You just like I'm not gonna let them experience it in the world, but I'm going to handicap them here in the house and let them fall into sin or, you know, let them do drugs or sex, whatever it is. I'm gonna let them just do it right here in my crib. Cause I feel like it's safer. That's yeah. Kind of jump into. Your, your points is that that's that's the wrong mindset. And that was what, what we were taught. Even I had a conversation with one of my, my parents. No. And I had to continue to reiterate. And as a, a, um, to kind of hit on the biblical fatherhood, we have to set the bar and the standard in our home. We cannot allow those things to filtrate in our home and and kind of uh, allow it just to anything goes there has to be a standard what's the standard right and i always use the example you don't take an android phone to an iphone store mm-hmm. right no we go to the creator to the maker that has given us these these principles he gives us the direction the instruction for our lives and when it says right don't let any profane language come out of your mouth or just simply, right, when we talk Proverbs 22, train up your kids in the ways that they should go so that they never depart. It's training them in 
honor and respect and having um, uh, respectable and integrity, having having the language that reflects that. It's, so it's just out of uh, out of integrity and out of having that respect for one another. And I literally got into an exchange with my family member because he wasn't budging. He almost got offended that I told him like out of respect, like, hey, you know, watch the language. Like, no, no, no. He comes at me with that response and I had to respond with a rebuttal. Like, no, 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 that's not the standard that I hold in my home. I'm asking you out of respect. Well, they're gonna learn it anyway. Like he, he just kind of kept hitting that home. But I said, well, they're not gonna, they're not gonna learn it in my home, and that's not the standard we're setting. Yet. And like, I would have been completely okay with walking out because it's like, who else is gonna set the standard? And and um, I, I use this phrase a lot: teach people how to treat us, right? Teach people how. We set our standard in our home. Now, I'm not saying it's black and white. I'm not saying we go to a crowd of 100 and be like, yeah, we're not down with that. No. But these are just certain little environments that we can guard our children from. Because yeah. what happens is, is that we have these people that were, that are beloved, right? They're our friends, they're our family, our close our relatives. And what happens is it confuses our kids to think, why is it like this on this side? But it's like this on that side. Mm-hmm. Maybe I could have a little bit of both, right? Because that's the that's the example I had. I would literally have that dynamic. I had one side of my family was super secular, super world, everything goes, and then I had the other aspect was hyper religious. So then I had a mixture of both coming up in my young adult life, and then. Now, being able to be intentional with our kids and protecting them, no, that, there's no chance. And I even had this conversation recently. It's like, why would I expect or want my kids to go through exactly what I went through at the same age? It, it, like, no, that's the purpose of us being one aware, right? That God has made us aware even at a young age. We're being super aware and super intentional with our kids. And two, is to keep them from the things that we went through. It's not to say, man, go live it, do it. That's exactly what I went through at that same age. No, man. We got to give them the red flags and the, the, you know, the stop signs so they don't blow through them and, and give them understanding on it. And it was back yeah. to my point that I opened up with, was living a transparent life with our kids. Who's going to teach our kids? Who's going to set that example? It's us. It's us living that out, being vulnerable, transparent, right? Not perfect parents or fathers. Um, but it's teaching them, hey, this is why. This is why we don't speak. Yeah. Hey, this is why um, you don't see daddy doing X, Y, Z. You know? Let me ask you a question real quick. Who was it? You probably remember. I'm trying to remember. I can't find it right now. Um, it's in the book of Samuel. I don't know if it's First Samuel or Second Samuel. Who was that whose sons, they was in the temple acting all crazy, disregard for the rules and the standard that God set for the temple. They were in there bringing prostitutes in there and then God killed them. I think it was Eli. Might've been Eli. Eli was a terrible father. So was so was King David. When you yeah. start reading the life of David, David was a terrible father, but we won't talk about King, uh, we're gonna talk about Eli really quick. Yeah. He, his kids, he didn't train them up, right? Yeah. Very, he didn't do a good job at setting the example and training his kids up. And so they took these things that were sacred to God. And they took them for granted. Mm-hmm. And here's a man that's anointed, right? God's using them. And God kills his kids because they're disrespecting yeah. the temple. Right, we see a lot in the Old Testament how serious God takes his word. Um, and a lot of things led to death right on the spot. Now we, I think we should still have that same sense of urgency as fathers with our children to let them know that a lot of things lead to death. Not just spiritually, spiritual death, but physical death. 
I mean, because we seeing it happen every day out here in these streets. And so um, that could be holy men, righteous men. But we we got to make sure that we're aligning ourselves as being, you know, godly fathers as well. Because yeah. if we don't, you can be up in the church preaching from the pulpit every week. But then at the crib, you're dis, you're not having a intimate relationship with your children. You don't know what's going on in their lives. Mm-hmm. But you know what's going on in everybody else's lives at the church. Yeah. And your kids grow up and they die spiritually or physically. Yeah. You weren't there to protect them. You didn't bring them up. And we see a lot of pastors fall into that. Right. Right. Um, as as a leader in the church, it was one of the the fears that I had that I literally sat down with my wife and we talk about boundaries and we talk about you know ministry times and what's too much and you know when to cut things off and when to say no. Um, because these are real real conversation that people have to have. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, pastor has a, uh, the pastor has a wife and he has children. He needs to be home. Right. He can't always just drop everything and run to, you know, save and to pray for everybody. Can't do it all. Um, but we definitely, as, as men of God, as as men who are doing things, you know, podcasting, uh, leading small groups in our churches, stuff like that. We got to make sure that we we guard ourselves to make sure that we're being godly fathers, that we're being intentional with home time and not just focusing on on the church um because we see it so many so many of these preachers kids cutting up jacked up you're like the preacher son how how the heck and all kids how you the worst one (laughs) you know what i'm saying and so man well we got we got to protect our kids we got to man we got to um it's a command yeah one of the biggest issues that um the sons of eli's had was their lack of submission to authority. Um, so they, they didn't want to be obedient. That fell on Eli himself, his father, their father. Exactly. Um, and then not falling in line with instruction. It was like those two things, literally, uh, back to the point from when, when, when we started, uh, the main topic on biblical fatherhood was the reflection of God um, uh, having the intimate um, relationship with Adam in the garden and right off the top those two things were set as a president as as a standard for adam it was obedience and it was instruction and it was those two things aside from having that intimate connection obviously a relationship with god the father it was right off the top it was setting the example of having an obedience right this is for you. This is, you're supposed to tour the land. Um, and he gave him everything, you know, created everything um, in his environment. And then it was giving him instruction. And then for that to be carried out. And we see how Eli's sons, they they, they kind of just went against uh, the priests. They wanted to, to do um, a certain amount of meat, a uh, certain uh, type of meat opposed to what was traditionally used for the sacrifice. It was like, wait a minute. Everybody's looking back to Eli, like, mm-hmm. like this you, ain't, you ain't you ain't train your kids on what it was, bro? Like, what's going on here? Loving the way they should go? Like, you, you <laughs> this is like ABC yeah. stuff, you know? Yeah. Definitely, I, I love the, the point, man, with authority, because authority is another hot topic that we have. Um, you know, being able to you know, submit and respect people who are in authority, police officers, you know, politicians, governors, people like that. Um, and that starts at the crib, right? If you, if your kids, if they, if they ain't going to submit to you, they ain't going to submit to the teachers. They ain't going to submit to, you know, the principal. They ain't going to submit to the security guard yeah. at the store. They ain't going to submit to the police. They ain't gonna submit to the firemen when they driving. And they got their siren zone. They're gonna be like, man, I'm Brad, bro. Y'all wait till I move. They're not gonna have any respect for authority. If they don't respect you as the as the father, as the person that they see every day, 
then they ain't gonna respect nobody else. Nobody else is gonna be able to tell them nothing. And I mean, you could do the study, do the research for yourself and just look at it. Look at how many kids, number one, I mean, right off the bat, you could just think about gangs. Think about gang members. They don't have a father. They don't have any structure, any order in their life. What do they do? They go into the streets and they don't have that same lack of submission that they have. Uh, they get it because number one, they didn't have it in their home. And so it comes out in the streets. There's no control. There's no order to their life. They like, I ain't, I ain't got to listen to do nothing. I do what I want to do. Yeah. And so, and it, it, we, I mean, we see it from the beginning of the time, man. Um, just when you don't train your kids up and it's the father's repeat. I'm going to keep repeating this. It's the father's responsibility. It's not the mother. The mother shouldn't be raising the kids. We have a lot of women that raise parents. I was raised by my mom by herself. Um, and they do the best they can. It's kind of became the norm here in America where the men, they leave and the women get stuck with the kids. And then we see the results of that. Just look at history. And um, that's not how God intended for it to be. Men, we are the leaders. We are to set the tone in the home. We're not here, yeah, yeah. And to that point, I don't want to like make it. We're not here bashing. No, no, no. Women, they they have their their responsibilities. They're very important. I think the way that God instructed, um, he set up marriage, right, with a man and a woman is that the man is like, he's more about order and discipline in most cases, right? And the women have that motherly touch, that nurturer, right, that encourager. You know what I'm saying? And and women have, you guys are very, very important to the operation. None of this works without you. So I just want to know, we love our wise women. It's not a thing of um, you guys are less than, like less important than us. No, you guys are just as important, but just like in everything, there is an order to things. And so how God set it up is that the man, all the responsibility falls on the man. This is what Tony Evans said. This is a quote from him. He said, it might not be your fault, but you're responsible. You might have didn't cause it, but you're responsible to fix it. And it, yeah, I, mean, I can get into a whole thing. I love Dr. Tony Evans. Shout out to Tony Evans. But um, I mean, powerful statement. Yeah. Right. And so we we love women. It's not to bash women. We're not like, oh man, women are less than, and we're just gonna, they gotta submit and do what we tell them. No, nah, man, they got their roles, which are given to them from God. Um and to my like I said. I mentioned earlier, like my my grandmother was was used by God to assume that role in my life. So there's a lot of things that she taught me and was able to um, talk to me about that obviously should have came from a father from a man's point of view. But she was able to give me just based off of her experience. So women women definitely I've seen my mom assume that role. Your mom assumed that role um, really well. Yeah, yeah, it might have not been their their role to fulfill, but God used them in that way, and, and we're definitely products of that, man. Yeah. My mom, man, uh, yeah, that's that'd be a whole other subject. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, shout out to all the mom, mom dukes out there. Yeah, but to um to close out the the whole protection, right? Uh, as far as the biblical father's protection, there's another point I wanted to make on my daughter, right? We've we've been able to intentionally. Um, uh, teach her how to how to be obviously uh, use her faith and and uh, guard herself. You know, have personal convictions because we have a relationship with Christ. Um, even her, like I use an example, she had an after school program, and the after school program was supposed to be a college prep after school program. The after school program day one is literally um groups of this is not this is not a, a condemnation towards any um lgbtq or anything like that but it became small groups of just lgbtq and everybody's free and all the conversations within the circles were about how certain kids or, or classmates were feeling and how how long they've been feeling it, and I don't know how exactly it, 
it went from it being a college prep after school program to identity and the you know the liberalism behind it. Yeah. I don't know how that went, but to give you a perfect example, my dad, my daughter, comes out of that that school program, and literally, I'm, I comes out the car, I'm like, hey, I was your, you know, I was your first day at school program or whatever. I'm thinking this is going to be the, the most awesome at school program, college prep thing. It's going to be, it's going to look good for her. And she says, Bobby, that will be my last day there. And I'm like, what happened? I'm starting to think the worst. I'm like, who did it? Point them out. Right, we got what was, <laughs> What's the sound about, of the gun cock sound? <laughs> right, I'm like, I went into thug mode. I'm like, this is this doesn't sound like her. But look how, what a blessing it is. And we're training them up in the right way. She comes and out of her personal, uh, you personal know, not, feeling, not feeling comfortable and feeling convicted, she says, Bobby, it was completely, I felt so uncomfortable. And I love, she's like, I, I like my classmates. I like some of them that were there and I hang out with them. But the whole entire time, it was just, small groups at tables talking about how they felt and um, whether or not they agree with these lifestyles. And I thought I was coming to learn about college stuff. And she was like, Papi, I don't want to go back. And I said, baby, you're so right. You will not go back. You don't have to go back. You don't have to tell nobody. You don't have to say anything. I'll take care of the rest. Man, is that such a such a great uh, that's a great story to lead us into this last part which is empower empowerment right we want to provide we talked about that we talked about protect but we want to empower our kids right we want our kids to grow up and we want them to be able to go from being infant babies and being 100% depending on us to growing up and once they hit 16, 17, 18 years old to be able to know how to critically think about issues and problems and be able to make their own decisions, right? Based on the training that hopefully a biblical father has given them. We want them to properly be able to make that transition. And so many, so many times we see this, especially in Christian households which is unfortunate. Yeah. They hold on to them, right? They, they never had that talk about sin. Goes back to that. But they hold on to them, almost handicapping them because they make every decision for them and not allowing them to make mistakes. Yeah. So now when they're 21 and they're in the real world, they have no idea how to do anything. Give you guys a quick story. I came across this young man and... Um, this young man was was in his early 20s and because his parents did everything for him he didn't know how to call comment to get his license now this is something small and i'm not saying this i'm not trying to make fun of the person but i'm saying at at 23 years old right you should be able to make that call to get your lights on it only take about five minutes and we got this thing on our phones right google right but i just say that to say like the lack of and i know his background and so i know that there was a lack of father even though his father was in his life his father didn't show him anything he didn't show him how to be a man he didn't show him how to you know open up a bank account and you know change your brakes on a car he didn't show him anything and that's such so, a simple, simple example that, I mean, obviously it can say, we can say that it was the father's response. That can be the mother's responsibility as well. So as a general uh, perspective, you know, for us as parents, like parenthood. Really. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I make the, tell, I say, tell the story to say that a lot of times if we don't allow our kids to grow and to make mistakes, right? And obviously we want to be there to, help them do those mistakes and, you know, to, to, to learn. But when they get to a certain point, we got to let them go, right? We got to remove ourselves from that 
and let them be adults and allow the training and the upbringing and the encouragement and all the things that we implanted in them, we should now see those things being lived out in their lives, yeah. right? Them doing it on their own, right? Just like your daughter did in that class. Like she was like, I ain't going back to there. This is definitely not what we being taught at home. I'm not with this. My dad told me about this. I'm out of here, right? Um, we should see that for them. Um, we should be uh, doing that at an early age, man, so that they can make those decisions. Because I believe that our kids are going to have to make those decisions a lot sooner in life because of everything that's going on, just like your daughter experienced. Yeah. Um, and so um, empowerment, man. We want to make sure that we go from baby and, and, and training them up so that they can be uh, uh, what's the term uh, uh, a law abiding a citizen um, a productive citizen here in this country that we live in and um, we should be able to do that and uh, a lot of a lot of you know Christian homes you drop the ball we hold on too tight we're not training them up and then when they become adults everybody's losing their minds because they don't know what to do they don't know how to think for themselves they don't know how to go to the word right which is a big one they don't know how to go to the word to get the information that they need for themselves because you never showed them how to properly like read the bible and how to go to the bible and how to pray and we've handicapped them and so we want to empower our kids we want to bring them up so that they can critically so they can make decisions on their own that's part of training our kids up like you know um, showing them how to do these things showing them what they look like right um i heard this one story from this one pastor and he does this with his kids he says um when they when they when they run to him right and they ask him questions about whatever it is they're asking them he asks them what would you do if i wasn't here and it allows them to play it out the scenario in their head to think I mean, we ain't always going to be able to run to daddy or we ain't always going to be able to run to mommy. And so he asks them the question. He could easily just tell them what to do. But he's like, hey, what would you do if I wasn't here? Let's play this out. And I think that that's such a simple but yet amazing thing that we can do with our kids to get them to start to think for themselves. And then when you make the mistake, I'll guide you, right? I'm going to guide you back to the right way to do something. But it gets you to think gets the kids to think like all right but what, what would i do if you wasn't here right we do this uh this thing where if a burglar comes in and um uh and somebody breaks into the house right me and mommy get killed or whatever what what maya my my daughter maya is being the oldest what are you gonna do and so we go through these scenarios and she knows what to do she, they know how to do the thing they know how to take a grown man down if they have to literally choked me out the other day my neck's still a little sore but we were practicing these situations right the, these are real life situations of things that happen now, i'm not telling my kids to go out here and somebody run up you just you try to fight them no but situations happen i want them to be able to do what they got to do and get out of there you know what i'm saying and so we, we go over these these scenarios real life scenario they man if you're out in the street you know how to cross the street right how to hold hands i did this one little thing with my daughter i told them i'm not picking you up from school so i need you to walk to papa's house right it was like two blocks from the school i was there i watched the whole thing play out i was literally across the street just watching them i watched my oldest daughter do exactly what I told her to do. And when her kids, when her, her uh, not her kids, but her siblings, when the younger was one listening, she was snatching them up. I was so proud. I was so proud um, being able to just watch them do that. Yeah. Watch her go to where they get out because they all came out of different doors. She grabbed each, each one in order and they all went and she walked the same way. Even the ones that were trying to be real talky-talky and talk to their friends, she was like, nah, we gotta go. Daddy said we gotta be here by this time. It was amazing. But she knew what to do. She knew what to look both ways, crossing the street, 
she knew to hold their hands. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was an amazing thing to see them being able to to walk two blocks by themselves uh, with all these other kids and their friends around, running around, doing things. They could easily be distracted. Um, but yeah, I mean, we got to do that uh, for our kids. So when they get up, become adults, you know, it goes back to knowing how to handle money, knowing how to make proper decisions. Um, and a big one is knowing how to rely on God in tough situations. Right? Trials and tribulations going to come. Are we telling our kids that they're going to come? Are we just like, ah, oh, man, you know, just trust God. Everything's going to be okay. Or are we telling our kids the real, which is things are going to happen. What are you going to do when they happen? Yeah. And so that's the other um, aspect of this. Um, and I'll continue to hit the point, right? Living a, a, a vulnerable and transparent life as a father um, and be able to use that as as a stepping stone and example for our kids, um, teaching them um, one, how to rely and trust um, that the Bible is our instruction for life, right? And, and how that plays out in our own life. How does it look like on a daily, daily basis, right? We see daddy pray, we see daddy read his word, we see daddy live it out. And then there's the other aspect to it is how do we teach them how to walk this life and empower them to even make it through? Because it's not if, it's when they're gonna go through trials. And it's kind of fulfilling and empowering them Right, with Proverbs 24, 16, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. How does that look like, right? That my kids have seen me uh, make a mistake in responding a certain way, make a mistake in maybe raising my voice. But how does that look like? Where at the end of the day or after the, a certain circumstance or a moment, we come back, we humble ourselves because the Bible says to humble us. The Bible says to, you know, to confess our sin or to repent for you know, a sin or a mistake we made. And we go and do that and we address it and bring everybody together so that we we're back and we're at peace. These are the certain things that we do to empower them so that when they, when it lives out in their life, it, it plays out the same way that we're not perfect and we're not trying to avoid circumstances like dodging bullets. Like, yeah. we're not going to do this around our kids. Cause I've seen a lot of our generation of parents do that. Well, we don't do this, you know, with our kids. We don't do that. And we, we, we don't let them do this and we don't let them do that. And it's like, you're trying to dodge and then by the time you know it, their kids, I mean, they're adults and they're like, oh, my, my parents never really taught me how to deal with that. They, they never taught me how to be around this environment and not do it. And I was, man, it looked kind of cool. Like, nah, dude, we're supposed to live this out. You're supposed to teach your kids how to be a Christian and how to live this out. And obviously use your your freedom not to sin, not to indulge into sin, but to indulge and in, in, in live a right life and not sin. Um, so that's the one thing, right? as far as empowering our kids. And I think the second aspect to that um, is empowering them in the sense that um, knowing that things are not going to be um, to our liking. Everything's not going to fall into to place. And how does that, what do we do when our faith is tested? Um, empowering them to to seek the word out and have a personal relationship with them and empowering them to have an independent relationship with Christ. Um, I do this thing, well, we, we do this thing, right? My wife and I are on the same page. But we talk to the kids that by the time they're 17, 18 years old after high school, we set the example that they should be able to live on their own. And that's the way we empower them. It's not in the sense that if they see that you know, our, our maybe a generation before us or or the traditional um, Hispanic, right? Not to kind of isolate us, but it's so heavily in Hispanic families where 
man, we see our kids and we let them, uh, they're 25, 35, 40, still in the crib. You know, I know, I literally know a truck driver right now, 43 years old, living in the basement at his parents' crib. Right. Making more than enough money to be able to get his own spot. Be like, shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. And 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 that's empowering them to to have um, independency um, and look forward to it. Look forward to it. So like my our oldest daughter, like she even oh yeah at eighteen yeah I want to go to college. And I would love to go board you know boarding school or, or go to uh, live on campus right live alone like yeah. Maybe you can do it. That's awesome. Yeah, have one boy a better apartment. You can you can make it real nice. You can take care of it and be organized. You can take it. You know what I'm saying? Have your friends mm-hmm. over and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that's how we empower. We don't guard them because it's like there's there is such things protecting them to a certain extent, but there is some things that we have to allow to play out in their life. Yeah, we allow them to make mistakes. Right, and trust that everything that we we train them and we taught them they're going to be able to you know play out in their life and they're going to make that those decisions and obviously there, there's going to be times where they make mistakes but man they're going to pick right back up because they saw their parents do it they saw their father their father do it oh man i remember my dad and my mom talking to me about you know these things and, and man i'm gonna go ahead and do this i'm gonna make this decision um yep and that's that's the empowering um that christ would have us um and obviously holding um, to the treasures that we are supposed to store up in heaven, right? We talk about living lives and morals and principles, right? Having honor, having respect, um, integrity, um, trust and forgiveness, right? How do these things play out? How do these, um, these things look in our lives? It's us setting that example within our marriage or, or just us having those talks with our kids and letting that um, empower them um, through their, you know, through their young, their young years, and even our young years, right? We're still learning, yeah. um, and that's the whole, that's the whole moral of all this is that none of us are going to be perfect at this. We're still um, progressing and, and um, working and learning, uh, making adjustments on the fly in our young lives. But yeah. being intentional and we're aware of it. And trusting God is, is leading us through this. Yeah. Yeah, man. And again, you know, I just want to say that that this this video or this podcast, this episode is not about uh, trying to condemn people. We're not trying to come off as like, hey, we're, we're holier than thou because, man, we fail and we drop the ball too sometimes. Man, I took this class called Growing Kids God's Way when uh, my daughters were small. They were still babies. And the biggest thing that I learned from that class was that none of this stuff works unless the parent is consistent. So number one thing that how we fail in everything, pretty much, like if you're not consistent at going to the gym and having a diet, you're not going to be in shape. You're not going to be healthy. Right. And then the same thing applies to being a, a Christian. If you're not in your word, if you're not disciplined and having prayer time. And, and spending time with the Lord and reading and learning about him, then when the enemy comes, bro, he's just going to smack you around. He's going to smack you around like a little rag doll. You're going to be thrown to and fro. You ain't going to know what to believe and, and how to believe and how to lean on Christ. And so, like, we're, I'm in a forever process of learning how to be a father. Because you go through different seasons of where, and when you got five kids, man, you got to come at all those kids a little different. I got some kids where I could just be straight, direct, and firm with them. I got some kids that I can look at and I can give them a look. They know. I got some kids that I have to have a, a very gentle approach to, right? And so you got to learn all these things, man. Like, what's the best way to meet them where they're at when you have to discipline them and you have to correct them? And so, you know, never, never on here trying to say, like, we're perfect and we got it all together. But... One thing that we do is that we have a brotherhood, we have a friendship, and uh, you know we hold each other accountable as men, as dads, um, as husbands, and um, we bounce ideas off each other. We talk about these things. Uh, we're transparent with each other, man. We've been you know friends for a long time, so um, we just we want to encourage people. 
And we want to we want to talk about this because I think the conversation of fatherhood, man, it's being dropped. And we just, I mean, we see it in society with all the craziness that's going on with kids. Like, why the you know gang banging started in the, what the late seventies? Why is it still going on in 2022? <laughs> why is it still gang banging going on? You know what I'm saying? Um, you can easily just look at that type of lifestyle and say, I don't want anything to do with that. And it should like immediately started to like die off, but it's still like thriving. Why is that? This is a question that I like, Lord, why is, why is these things still happening? And so a lot of it, right. When we get down to the human aspect of it and our responsibility as, as Christians is that, yo, know, fathers are dropping the ball. The men who are called to lead this call to protect, call to provide, call to empower. We're not doing it in the way that the Lord would have us to do it. And so these things are going to continue to happen. Now you're going to have that one bad apple, that one kid that even you could be praying night and day and Satan just got that little dude or that little girl. And <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, we got to do better. We got to step up, man. God gave us dominion over this. Like, we have the power to literally change the atmosphere in, in whoever room that we're in. And we should be walking in that authority. We should be uh, fulfilling our roles as husbands, as fathers. And so, um, I mean, that's it. We just want to encourage you guys, man. And, and I pray that this, would, this episode would be a blessing. I pray that you guys will go back and just read the material man there's so many things all you gotta do is just google like biblical fatherhood you know like we're not giving you some type of secret sauce that we found like all this stuff is is here right it's just the bible it's the word um there's so many resources and different books man i can literally if i showed you my bookshelf i have so many books on on, on fatherhood and, and and you know just being a kingdom man and things like that um that it's so many resources and so to all the fathers out there to every father especially those believers like let's let's be intentional about being the fathers that god has called us to be let's be intentional about leading out our homes and training our kids up in the way that they should go let's be intentional about you know teaching them the word man um Let's 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 be a community. And there's groups on Facebook, one group that I'm part of. It's all fathers, man. They we talk about real things, right? Bounce ideas off each other. And um, you know, there is a there isn't a, a what is it, a, a one tool like fix all when it comes in the natural. Of course we got the Bible, right? Um, but when you start living that out, man, there's you know, different ways for different kids and different things like that and let, let's let's all have the bible be our foundation on how we raise our families yeah definitely and if you guys uh, have anything to share as far as like books or material uh, resources please share them in the comments and then we can all benefit from it you know, I'm sure there's, there might be some things out there that we were not aware of uh, that we can make and learn from uh, yeah but yeah definitely awesome to wrap this one up and uh, yeah, hope everybody enjoyed this one. Uh, thanks again for listening. We enjoyed this episode. Um, I hope you guys can help support our podcast. Please share it with others. Uh, post about it on social media. Um, you know, leave a perspective. Go on Facebook. We love you guys. Be blessed. Yeah, man. You guys have a good one. Thanks again. We appreciate you guys. And we'll see y'all on the next one. All right. Peace. Peace.